Well, praise the Lord, City of Joy family. Pastor Carlos Smith here from the Journey Hanley Road, and I am here to share with you the glorious gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is always my joy to share with you all, to preach for you all, uh, even uh, digitally nowadays. You know, we're getting our social distance on, but I look forward to when I can be with you all uh, in person again. And thanks again to Pastor Kempton uh, for just giving me the privilege to share with you all uh, on this Sunday morning. Uh, so if you have your Bibles, if you would turn with me uh, to the Gospel of John, the fourth Gospel, uh, and we're going to be looking at chapter 17 uh, and verses 20 through 23. So just a couple verses here, John 17, uh, verses 20 through 23. And I'll be reading to you from the English Standard Version, and therein the reading is thus. I do not ask for these only but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have also given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you have sent me, and love them even as you love me. Would you pray with me, family? Father, this is your prayer. This is your prayer for the unity of your church and of your body. Uh, Father, we know and you know, of course, how far short of this we have fallen. But God, I pray today that through the power of your words, you would give us hope, that you would reveal to us more and more about how we are to walk out and live out our calling of oneness that you have purchased with your own blood. So be with us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Uh, for a, a title and a thought, real simple title and thought, I'm just going to simply talk about what I just read, Jesus' prayer for unity. Uh, Jesus' prayer for unity. Um, around this time, every four years, uh, as Christians, we have the opportunity to vote uh, and to cast ballots for who's going to be the next president of these United States. Uh, and like clockwork, there's always division, there's vitriol, there's uh, questions, there's accusations, there's the back and forth tug and war. Um, and I'm not even talking about the word, I'm talking about within uh, the body of Christ. And with all this going on, it just seems that this year uh, is worse than normal, to be honest. Uh, it seems like this year is more divisive, it's more uh, 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 hatred, more name calling, more pointing of fingers, more accusations uh, than in your typical election year. And you know, as I came to this text and I began to think about preaching and sharing with you all about this idea of unity, uh, family, City of Joy family, I'm going to be honest, I'm going to be a bit transparent with you. It's, it's, it's hard to come to this text and just say, oh yeah, let's, you know, let's just be united for Jesus. And it's, it's hard to, to look at this text and just say, oh yeah, one, oneness is, is what we need and, and let's overlook all of these things. Because to be honest... It's been a hard year, not just obviously we didn't have coronavirus, we didn't have uh, economic up upheaval. Some of us have lost jobs, has lost employment. It's just the stress, just normal things that you would do, like going to the supermarket or going to the gym have become stressful. And then and you throw in on top of that division and name call and aggression on social media. Some of us have probably been on the receiving end of some of that, and it may make a message like this one, a text like this one, it may make you feel like, like, man, are you, what planet are you living on, Pastor Lowe's? What, 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 what planet are you, do, are you, have you looked at your social media feed? Have you, have you looked at Twitter? Are you seeing what some Christians, professing Christians are saying? They're saying things like, if you vote for Trump, there's no way you can be a Christian. Or if you vote for uh, Biden, there's no way you can be a Christian. And folks are disowning one another over who they vote for and whether they're Republican or whether they're a Democrat. Or, or how can you stand here and preach about unity? And here's what I want to say to you, City of Joy family is that first of all, like if that, those are your sentiments, I, I feel you a thousand percent. Even if you're like, listen, I, I know that 
We're supposed to be united. We're supposed to be one in Christ, but you're like, I, I, I don't feel one. And, and, and you may even feel like, frankly, man, I'm tired of trying. I'm tired of working and striving for unity. I'm tired of pursuing after being one in Christ. It takes so much energy. It just burns so many calories to even try. I'm just tired. Listen, child of God, I, I want to let you know that I don't stand here just because I'm a preacher and because I'm a pastor and because I share the word of God. I don't stand here um, immune to some of those same feelings. I don't stand here. Um, I, I can't tell you, as the leader of a multi-ethnic church where I got people on, on, on all sides of the aisle coming from different backgrounds, coming with different interests and all that, I feel that tug and that pull. I've even been on the rece receiving end of some harsh accusations and folks questioning my orthodoxy. So listen, if you're tired or you're frustrated or you don't know if you want to have this conversation, I know I have experienced similar feelings in this season. I want to tell you that um, being a Christian and wrestling and, and sharing with these thoughts about unity from the Lord's Prayer, it doesn't make you out of touch or you're not wrong for having some of those feelings because, I mean, I just know what they're like. But let me tell you how the Lord began to massage in my heart because listen, I'm gonna be honest with you. I started looking at blog posts from my favorite preachers and quotes from, you know, influencers from nowadays and, and, and none of it was, was quite getting to the heart of how I was feeling and what I was wrestling through. And what the Lord brought me to was this text. And the first word of this prayer actually starts in verse one of chapter 17. When John writes, when Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, child of God, in my own fatigue, and I'm just going to be honest, I was fatigued and tired and tired of the wrestle and the conversations and all the things that go into trying to be one. I got tired and frustrated with continuing the dialogue and all these things that we have to go through, it seems, constantly. The fact that the text that I'm reading right now is a prayer of our Lord Jesus Christ re-energize my soul to be able to continue to labor and to pursue the unity of the body of Christ. Listen, if this had been the prayer of John Calvin, it would have been cute and it would have been nice, but it probably wouldn't have been enough. If it had been the prayer of, of Martin Luther King, that would have been nice, it would have been great, but it wouldn't have been enough. If it had been the prayer of some other prominent pastor or leader, that would have been nice, it would have been fine, but it wouldn't have been enough. But the fact that this is the prayer of the only begotten Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, tells me that this is a prayer that is guaranteed to be answered. And so the moments when I felt hopeless, the moments when I felt like I just wanted to give up, the moments when I felt like I just wanted to abandon this enterprise altogether, I was re-energized and undergirded by the Son of God's prayer, knowing that Jesus said, the Father loves the Son. And that there is not a prayer that fell from the lips of our Savior that God the Father will not answer in the affirmative with a hearty yes and amen. And so listen, I wish I, wish I could tell you now what, what, what I don't know, what I don't know, and what I'm not, I'm not fully sure on and I'm not completely clear on is how he's going to achieve it. I, I, I wish I could tell you that, hey, y'all, you know, if we rally behind the right candidate and, you know, vote for this person and around November 3rd, we're going to end up and we're going to all be unified. I, I, I don't know how, but I do know who. And the who that prayed this prayer is Jesus Christ. And so we know that somehow, some way, through the power of his spirit, God is going to answer this prayer. And so I want to encourage some of us who might be hopeless, who might be tired, who might be frustrated, who might look at Facebook or look at Twitter and just want to throw in a towel. You might check your news and you might just feel like there is no hope for the body of Christ. Child of God, take a moment and remember that our Savior, our Lord, before he goes to the cross, that's, that's where we are in the text. Before Jesus goes to the cross, this is his prayer that he prays. And people of God, this is our hope for unity. This is why the children of God cannot just merely give up hope because we know that the Father is going to answer it. And so this prayer before Jesus, literally in chapter 18, is arrested, he lifts up this prayer of his soul in his anguish before he goes to the cross and he prays, God, make my people one. How important must the unity of the church then be 
before the Son of God. How important must the unity of the people of God be if before he goes to the cross, the thing that Jesus pleads for the most is that we may be one. And so my prayer for us is that we will feel the, insur the assurance of this prayer because here's the reality of it. We look at what's going on in 2020. We look at what's going on now. We look at what's going on with the election. We look at what's going on with coronavirus. We look at what's going on maybe in our own lives. Maybe it's that, that economic wrestle. Maybe we are looking for work. Who knows? Maybe you're just like me and you're trying to, trying to uh, uh, do virtual schooling with your kids and that's crazy. And you're trying to figure out how do I do virtual schooling or hybrid schooling with my kids and I have to go to work every day. Let me tell you another piece of assurance that is tucked right in this text is actually in verse 20. Jesus says, look, I don't ask for these only, talking about the ones who are around them, but I also ask for those who will believe in me through their word, that's us. So he says, listen, I'm not only praying for the disciples, the apostles who are right there in front of me, I'm praying for those who will believe through their word. That's us. What we have in this scripture is the words of the apostle. And here is what Jesus says. I have prayed for them. Listen, let me, let me share with you, child of God, whether we're wrestling with the reality of the 2020 election or we're wrestling with the reality of coronavirus or we're wrestling with the reality of how our families and how our lives have been impacted in this insane year. Here's what I do know. Jesus is not sitting at the right hand of God, wringing his hands, trying to anticipate and wait and look at and see who's gonna be the president of the United States. Jesus is not wringing his hands, wondering how on earth am I going to deal with coronavirus? Jesus says in verse 20, I've already prayed. I've already prayed and lifted up petition to my father for the believers for all time in all places. And child of God, here, here's the good news in that. It's that Jesus, has it covered? We have already been covered by the almighty son of God in prayer. And listen, you might be like, okay, uh, uh, Pastor Carlos, this is, this is a, 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 a 2,000 year old prayer. Let, let me tell you something. Let me, let, let me do, do a little theology for you. There's this cool doctrine. It's called the doctrine of the session of Christ. What, what do you like, Carlos? Look, them, 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 them educated folk work. What are you talking about the session of Christ? You know, this idea is real simple. It's a real simple session. It's about Jesus sitting down. You're like, what do you mean it's about him sitting down? It's about this idea that Jesus Christ, after having made atonement, he went and sat down at the right hand of God. And the text tells us, look at what the Bible tells us, that it is Christ who died for us. And more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God. This is Romans 8, who is indeed still interceding for us. You're like, what, 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 what do you mean? What are you saying? Not only did Jesus have us covered 2,000 years ago in the garden as he prayed for us here in John 17, but Jesus has us covered right now, today, at the right hand of God. This means that you have the Son of God, hear me out, child of God, interceding and praying for you as you walk through what you're walking through. Here's the point. We are not alone. We are, are, are not, uh, we, are, we are not walking through this as the body of Christ, as the people of God. We are not walking through this um, uncovered. We are not walking through this without assistance. We are not walking through this um, all by ourselves. We have the Son of God who has prayed and he is praying for us. And so when we think about this text, this text is all about unity. This text uh, that is about the people of God being one. This text who, that is about keeping us together. You, how, do, how do we understand it? How do we have hope? What is our hope for unity rooted in? Because you, you, you probably listen like, okay, I, 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 I listen for a minute. But, but what is the basis of this hope? It's, it's, it's not all, I, I mean, here's the truth of the matter. You know, the, Jesus' prayer, that should be enough. This should be a one-point sermon. That should be enough to help you get on through. Jesus, the Son of God, didn't ask. God's going to answer that prayer. We're going to be united. We're going to be good. But Jesus is gracious, and he doesn't only leave us there. He actually shows us where our unity is, is rooted, and that's what I want to point at, City of Joy. Just three quick things, three quick snap, snapshots that shows us where our unity is rooted in as the people of God and why we as the church, even in the midst of division, can continue to have hope. Look at verse 21. 
It says, look at Jesus' prayer. It says that they may all be one, talking about the church, us, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. People of God, our oneness, our unity is rooted in the Godhead. Our unity is rooted in the reality that we believe in a Trinitarian God, Father, Son, and Spirit, who are not three gods, but one God who is one substance, one usia. We believe in one Father from whom the Son is eternally generated. We believe in one Spirit who proceeds from the Father and the Son, and that the Father is in the Son, and the Son is in the Father, according to Jesus. This is that spiritual unity, or if you want a $20 word, if you want to know smart people, the perichoresis, the interpenetration of the members of the Trinity, that one nature is in the nature of the Father, is in the nature of the Son, is in the nature of the Spirit, and that they are all one through the Spirit. So you're like, okay, wait a minute, you're talking about our, our unity is rooted in the Godhead. What, what are you talking about? This, this is what God does in bringing us into fellowship with himself. In inviting us into union with Christ, he invites us into the Trinitarian dance and fellowship that has happened from all eternity. Our unity, this is how I know, this is what got me off my uh, place of despair, my place of frustration, and this is what happened when I finally turned off Facebook long enough to get my head in the Bible, is that through the power of the Spirit, God indwells each and every believer and unites us with himself and unites us with one another. You're like, Carlos, that, all right, that sounds real theological or, or something like that. You got some Bible? You know I got some Bible for you sitting in jail. I ain't going to leave you without the Bible. Look, look at uh, John 14, 15. Look at what Jesus says. He says, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him for he dwells with you and he will be in you. It is this spirit that dwells each and every believer. So you're like, okay, that's, that's, that's cool, that's dope. Um, what's that got to do with unity? That means that this unity that we strive for, that we fight for is already true through the spirit of Christ, whether we acknowledge it or not. So, and so now you're like, okay, cool, dope theology, so what? Here's so what? We need to be careful how we speak about other children of God. That's the so what. That means that that Christian, and you can be a Christian and vote Democrat, contrary to what some folks would lie to you and say, that Christian that's a Democrat, that you don't understand how they're a Democrat, has the Spirit of God dwell in them. And let me be clear. Let me, let me just say this one time for the one time. Don't be that person on social media that's talking about ain't no way you can be a Republican and, 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 and be a Christian. Ain't no way that you can be a Democrat and be a Christian. Let me tell you something real quick. The only litmus test for being a believer is complete faith and trust in the finished perfect work of Jesus Christ. That's it. And so if your basis of Christianity is anything else, you're dabbling in heresy. So stop saying it. But beyond that, beyond that, when we think about how we talk about one another and talk to one another, child of God, that, that Democratic Christian or that Republican Christian, do you realize that they have the Spirit of God dwelling in them? Now listen, this isn't to say uh, that you agree with all of their, their, their political views or that everything they post is right or, or uh, everything, every view that they uh, hold is, is logically consistent. That's not to say any of that stuff. That's not to say that we can't have real and true disagreements with one another around matters of politics and policy or, you know, worldview on, on certain things. But what it does mean is that we have to respect them as one, number one, just number one, as one made in the image of God. But two, if they're a Christian, as one in whom the Spirit of God dwells. Let, let, me, let me put it to you this way. You know, I, I was watching uh, Netflix because, uh, you know, it's been quarantined. So I've been watching a little more Netflix, a uh, little more than normal. Uh, you know, I've been chilling. And so I finally got around to watching uh, The Last Dance. It's the series about Michael Jordan and the Bulls, how they won those six titles and all that good stuff. Um, and I'm from Detroit. I'm from D, okay? I'm, I'm, I'm a, I remember the Bad Boys era. I was coming of age when all that happened, you know, with, with uh, you know, with Zeke and, you know, Dennis Rodman and Bill and Beer 
Tom Sally, the whole crew, you know, I was right there. And, um, you know, what was interesting, I remember when it happened, uh, when Dennis Rodman went to the Chicago Bulls. Like, that was crazy around Detroit. Like, how can Dennis Rodman, one of the, or the baddest of the bad boys, how is he going to go to the Chicago Bulls? And so they, in these interviews, they start talking about how different Dennis Rodman was from Michael Jordan. How Michael Jordan, you know, Michael Jordan back then, you know, he put on a suit just to walk from the locker room to the bus for the photo op. I mean, he was buttoned up. He was disciplined. He was in practice every day. Dennis Rodman dyed his hair every which way, partied all the time, you know, drank, partied, smoked, just, just kind of a wild dude. And something was interesting about watching that. You know, Dennis Rodman, he began to talk. He says, uh, Michael Jordan, the buttoned up Michael Jordan, the disciplined Michael Jordan, he said he accepted me for who I was. And we had the same goal. He knew I wanted to win, so he accepted me for who I was. And check this out. You know, you, you think about that team or, or any team, you know, you, you, you think about how that works together. They rallied around one goal. They threw on the same jersey, so we're, they were on the same team. And they had the same coach, Phil Jackson. And those elements united two people who were very different as they focused on winning that trophy, as they focused on winning the NBA championship. And child of God, listen, I know some of us, now I'll let you figure out which one of us, I don't know who, who's Dennis Rodman, who got the hair all different kind of colors and piercings and tattoos. I'll, I'll let you figure it out, out for yourself. But what I do know is this, that your brother and your sister may be very different from you. They may think very different from you. They may have very different commitments from you. They may look different. They may vote different. They may eat different types of food. But we got one goal. That's the gospel. We got one team. That's the church. And we got one coach. That's Jesus Christ. And we're trying to make it to glory. And listen, your brother and your sister may be very different from you, but we all have the spirit. That's the jersey, the spirit that's on all of our back. And we are seeking to advance towards Christ. Child of God, I want to encourage you, be careful the way you undermine and talk about and post about somebody for whom Christ died. And so we see that our unity is rooted in the Godhead. Uh, which is really awesome. We see that in verse 21, but in verse 22, we see that our unity is rooted in the gift of God's glory. Look at verse 22. It says, the glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one. This is, you know, when we start thinking about the glory of God, that's, that's fascinating. That's, that's powerful. I mean, the glory, this is Jesus talking, the glory that you have given me, I have given to them. Jesus says, I've given them a taste of my glory. I've given them a piece of my glory. And you're like, Carlos, what, what is that glory? I mean, I know the glory of God. We know that God uh, dwells in unapproachable splendor and glory. We know that Jesus is more glorious than we can ever get our heads around. We know that the Father dwells in unapproachable light and unapproachable glory. What does it mean when Jesus says that I've, I, I've given you the glory that you have given me, I've given to them? I think is in the B part of that verse, that they may be one. Even as we are one, the glory is in our union with Christ, in our union with one another that comes about through the power and the baptism in the spirit. And so through our union with Christ, we partake in our salvation. And we are united to the love, the joy, and the glory in our, and participate in this intra-Trinitarian love affair. And so in Christ, we experience a variety of experiences of this glory. Romans 6 says that we were buried therefore with Christ by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too walk in newness of life. So we have the glory of the new birth. Not only that, we have the glory of the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 1 says, we were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it. Check this out, to the praise of his glory. Not only that, we experience the present glory of adoption into the family of God. For all, uh, Romans 8 says, for all who were led by the Spirit of God are sons and daughters of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry, Abba, Father. 
The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if heirs, then heir, then heir, if children, then heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, provided that we suffer with him in order that we may be, watch this, glorified with him. Not only that, we look forward to the future glory of redemption. Here's what Paul goes on to say in Romans 8. For I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. You see, as the children of God, we have this gift of glory that God has given to us. And check it out. Let me be clear. Look at this. Look at this. It's a gift. Jesus says, this is the gift. This is what I have given to them. The glory that you have given them. Check this out. I have given to them. The glory is a gift of Christ. The glory is a gift of our salvation. The glory is a gift that Jesus purchased with his own blood that none of us deserve. And here is a part of that glory. The glory is not only union with Christ, but it is union with one another, that they may be one, even as we, Father, are one. And here's the issue that I'm concerned with, people of God. I believe we are trading the glory of our oneness with Christ and our oneness with one another for the glory of union with Republicans and Democrats. I mean, come on, fam. Did you watch any of these debates? Really? Are we going to trade the glory of our oneness for glory for the glory of oneness with either of these individuals? Are we really going to divide the beautiful, blood-bought, word-washed, spirit-infused bride of Christ to be united with individuals, neither of whom are particularly worried about any of us? How, why, why, would we, why would we sacrifice? Why would we pour out and give up the glory of the beauty of the unity of the body of Christ to be united with a political party of, and, and system which the Bible teaches us, regardless of which one you pick, vote, vote for who you want to. But what we see in Daniel and what we see in Revelations is that all of them are going to end up as some kind of beast anyway that persecutes the people of God and that Christ is going to destroy with the brightness of his coming. Why would we give it up? You see, the glory of our union, the glory of the bride of Christ is just, it's just, it's just better looking than the, 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 the elephant or the donkey, you know. But some of us are just bent on doing what this fella in the Old Testament named Esau did. You see, Esau was the brother of the namesake of the nation of Israel, Jacob. Esau was the first in line for his father Isaac. Esau was supposed to inherit wealth and prestige and a glorious family name. And most of all, he was supposed to inherit the right to carry on the lineage of the seed of the Messiah, of the nation from whom the Messiah would come. He was supposed to inherit that. But you see, Esau had an issue with immediate gratification. He had that issue when it came to sexual relations, which is why he intermarried with Canaanite women. He had that issue also when it came to just simple passions such as food. You see, he came to his brother Jacob. Now, Jacob wasn't all the way innocent in this, but Jacob was sitting there making some soup. And Esau came in from hunting. He was a hunter and he said, hey, bro, good looking suit you got. Soup you making. Can I get a bowl? And Jacob said, I'll give you a bowl if you give me your birthright. Esau said, what good is a birthright to me if I'm dead? I want some soup. Give me my soup. And the Bible tells us how to read and understand that interaction. You can just say, was Jacob just being wrong? The Bible says that Esau despised his birthright. And he went ahead and sold it to Jacob for a bowl of soup. And some of us are getting some cold, canned soup from these political parties. It's cold, it's canned, it got too much sodium in it anyway. Its process is disgusting. And we are selling our birthright as the children of God. The birthright that Jesus purchased for each and every one of us. We are selling it, giving it away for a bowl of soup. And what God is saying is that I got something so much more glorious for you. I got something so much more beautiful. And that is union with me. 
and union with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Just like the Trinitarian unity that models and gives us the beauty, beautiful unity and diversity that we experience in all of creation, even so in the body of Christ. We have unity and diversity, and yet some of us are willing to sell that out for a bowl of Republican or Democrat stew. Why would we? And so what we see, City of Joy family, is that our unity is rooted in the Godhead. Our unity is rooted in the gift of God's glory. And lastly, in verse 23, we see that our unity is rooted in the goal of the gospel. The goal of the gospel, what, what is the goal of the gospel? Look at verse 21. That they may be one, may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they may be in us, here's the goal, so that, purpose clause, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Look at verse 23. You see it again. It's actually twice in the verse. It says, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one. Here's the purpose clause. So that the world may know that you sent me. Our goal is that the world may believe that Jesus has come. And people of God, our greatest evangel to the world is our unity with Christ and our unity with one another. Listen, let me tell you what it ain't. It ain't right now, you know, how crispy your stream is. That ain't it. It ain't our buildings. It's not smoke machines. It ain't how good our band is. It's not how beautiful our buildings are. All of that stuff will perish. What our evangel is, what our call to demonstrate is, is the beauty, beauty of the intra-Trinitarian love affair before the entire world and when the world see the beauty of that unity and diversity Jesus says you know what they're gonna say Jesus must be real the fact that that place has black and white Republican and Democrat they have uh, people who are single moms people who are married families people who say black lives matter people who say blue lives matter they're somehow all together in the body of Christ people will look at that and Jesus says they will believe that the Father has sent me. And so our call, people of God, is to put on display the glory of Christ, to put on display the unity of the people of God so that the world may see and believe that Jesus has come. Listen, here's the reality, people of God. It's hard. It's, it's, it's going to be tough. I, I, and I just want to repeat this. I know I said it a lot up front, but I, I understand how deep-seated and deeply felt these divisions are and how we genuinely often believe, like what we're saying, like, man, some of these views on these different sides are deeply problematic. I, I understand. I hear you. But we have to make our way back to the prayer of Jesus. And we might not know how we're going to get there. We might not know how this is going to end up. But child of God, I want to encourage you. One, to take hope that God is going to answer this prayer from his son. But I also want to encourage you to begin to walk out and live out this unity, even if it's awkward. Even if, 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 if you ain't even all the way feeling it right now. This is God's will for us. This is God's instruction to us. We really are, here, here's the killer part, right? We actually are one through the power of the Spirit. Read the book of Ephesians when you got some time. We, we are one. Now it's up to us to be what we truly are, which is united in Christ. Let me pray for you to that end, city of joy. Father, God, I pray for this beautiful local expression of your bride. Father, I don't know the ins and outs. I don't know everything that's going on, but I just know in, in churches and in places uh, around this country right now, God, your church, we are just, uh, your church uh, body in America right now is just expend, uh, experiencing what almost seems like convulsions and spasms of division. Father, I pray for City of Joy Fellowship. That God, even if they are wrestling and trying to figure out what oneness looks like, even if maybe there are some hard interactions, maybe if there are some Facebook conversations that haven't been edifying, God, I pray that you would help them to walk out what is already true through your blood, through your spirit. God, help them to live out that unity. Help them to live out that oneness. Father, help them to be one. As the Father is in the Son, and as the Son is in the Father, as they are indwelt and enjoy the fellowship of the Spirit, and as we have been brought into the beauty of the intertrinitarian dance, I pray for the oneness of City of Joy. 
I pray that you would give them the gift of oneness and joy together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you, City of Joy. Always a pleasure to share with you. And I look forward to seeing you in person soon as all this stuff is over. God bless you. I love you and I'm praying for you all.